Welcome to our webinar today, uh, Connecting Data Machines and the Workforce. And uh, today, I believe we're going to have a lively discussion um, and, uh, and hopefully a lot of interactions between uh, the, uh, the audience and uh, also our speakers. Uh, as we get started, uh, just a few uh, um, housekeeping items. The, um, throughout the question, uh, throughout the session, please answer any open questions or ask open questions in the chat. Uh, and this way, while we're watching this uh, as it rolls by, and this way we can uh, hopefully answer your questions throughout. The question is really, who are we and uh, what are we talking about? So uh, a quick uh, intro to me, Eva Schönleitner. I'm the CEO of Great.io, and you'll hear more about that in a second. Joachim? Yeah, my name is Jorim Rademaker, and I'm the CEO of Manual2. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Jorim, uh, for joining today. I, mean, I think it's going to be a really interactive uh, and uh, a fun session today. So thank as you. I mentioned, um, housekeeping, please um, add your questions as, uh, as you hear and as they come to you uh, to the chat. Um, as all the uh, panelists or uh, the uh, attendees will be muted throughout and will open up for the end at the Q&A, but I'd like to really answer uh, open questions throughout. Um, I did mention uh, I'm the CEO of Create.io. Um, what is Create.io? Uh, we are actually a technology company um, that uh, the core of our solution is a database for operational analytics, also very relevant uh, for um, dealing with the machine data and sensor data. Um, and just at the end of 2021, uh, we also launched as a smart factory solution that uh, also uh, Urim's company is part of. And that is what the topic is today uh, in the area of industry 4.0 and smart factory. Um, Urim, uh, why don't you give it a bit of a shout of uh, what your company is about? Sure. Yeah, so we're a web-based platform. Right? We're a software as a service platform that has one single mission, making sure that everybody in your workforce always knows how. How to do your job, how to clean a machine, how to change a setting. Any kind of typical practical know-how is shared with this software platform. What's specific about it is that it's very easy to use by literally anyone. You don't need special skills. You don't need special training to learn how to use the software. It's completely industry agnostic. It works in any uh, it works in pharma and in, in, in manufacturing and in, uh, all kinds of technical services. Another thing we notice is that um, it works uh, in any language because the workers of today, especially in Europe, but also in the US and other countries, are increasingly multilingual. The idea that one size fits all no longer holds true. And of course, we're also device agnostic. So we've been around since 2016. Uh, we've met you guys great uh, back in the day when we were both part of the Microsoft London Accelerator. And since then, actually, we've started working together. So it, we go way back together. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, let's, um, I'll leave it to you. Excellent, excellent. So what we thought today is uh, we, we said, okay, the topic is really how to uh, succeed in digital transformations, especially in the area of Industry 4.0. So uh, we figured uh, we'll discuss this topic first a bit of uh, how to take, how to accelerate the uh, digitalization and digital transformation. Um, and, uh, and then walk into the topic, what we've seen our customers do and also partners, how they get into really succeeding these industry 4.0 um, initiatives and what it actually takes. Great. So I know I come from the technology and you're in my, you also come from the technology side, but uh, the core yeah. and the crux of what we've found is, um, yeah, technology is the enabling factor. And this is what drives industry 4.0 in terms of even enabling use cases. We'll get into that, what those are, but it really takes three areas and the areas of technology, the area of process and the area of people. I don't know, Joram, uh, you want to maybe also um, add to that um, before we get into more details. No, I agree. I think uh, when you were talking about Industry 4.0, it's important to keep in mind the human operator. It's not just about technology. If you want to really drive digital adoption, you have to understand the way the human operator works and tailor to their needs. 
Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, what is this in the middle there? We're seeing uh, a quick on as a logo, and this is actually the smart factory solution I mentioned. But uh, if we really look at it, when you look at the industry 4.0, I mean, the latest technologies of uh, like 5G and then Wi-Fi and connectivity, uh, obviously the wide availability of, uh, of uh, the internet and the cloud really enabled the transformation. So there is technologies that now are emerging uh, and more than emerging actually going uh, into high production environments. Um, they're beyond the pilots uh, that actually enable this. Uh, but all our customers from what I've seen over the years now is uh, it's one thing to, to test the technology and try it out a bit. When you really move it into production, uh, it really needs to, uh, you need to look at all three components. Um, the technology, and I mentioned just initially, we come from a database space, which is uh, very fundamental. Uh, but, uh, and uh, you know, Joram, you briefly explained that you have some enabling uh, technologies to help uh, get adoption going. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I think it's, it's really critical uh, to look at all three components, especially when you are in industries where you do have you know, the, the people factor involved. So we're talking specifically about industries where you have um, you know, operators, manpower, people still involved. They're not completely autonomous just yet. As you're moving along there, let's say when we're talking smart factory kind of evolution from automation to complete autonomy. So um, what we actually did um, is through actually one of our you know, pilot customers over the years, we've realized, oh, it's not just about a database um, that then enables the digital use cases and you can get the sensor data, machine data and analyze in real time and actually affect really the what in manufacturing you call the control loop. But what does it really take and, uh, and really to get the adoption to a very rapid way and to standardize in a good way um, across uh, these factories that we're starting to implement, it really needed a tool set, I would say, um, a helping tool to help the operators and the supervisor and the maintenance crew um, to basically go through the day and manage this new data and optimize the factories they were running. And so this is how this came about. It started out of a pilot uh, with a customer today live in um, about 20 plants with this customer globally. Um, and then we realized, wow, this is not just a thing for one customer. It really needs, it really should be something uh, that we need to bring onto the market because it's very unique. Uh, it's not quite out there yet. Uh, and it's clearly the next generation of how to help the transition and the implementation of, uh, of moving to a smart factory principally. So what is it really? Uh, what have we seen? Um, it is a, a mobile application. Um, and that is why uh, Yoram's team is involved as well. Um, also then on the back end, of course, on, uh, on the, the web. Um, and it basically stays with the operator, uh, meaning the people working in the plant um, on the cell phone and the smartphone. Um, and uh, basically shows uh, and helps them standardize the internal processes of what they do in the day-to-day -day life of uh, managing and operating the plant. And we'll show a little video in a second what I'm talking about. But this is really what it is. So if you have, uh, this brings huge benefits. Um, it shows you basically as the person working is like, oh, here's this checklist. Uh, please uh, work on this first, check off, uh, move on to the next. So watch out at X time. There is a, um, you know, some task to be done, a change of a machinery or uh, a swap of some cycle. Um, and you need to do this now. And if you can't do it, but it's critical, then you can send it off to another person. So it's basically kind of a, workflow engine for um, operators in the plant um, that really help you standardize um, very quickly and also guide uh, the workers throughout the day. What it also does is, uh, is you can then beyond just the standard everyday tasks, oh, you could now take the machine data you're getting uh, in addition to maybe new sensor data you're getting from the live uh, manufacturing environment, uh, bring those in as well into a central hub uh, and in real time uh, or near real time, very fast, uh, depending on customer, how fast they need it, then actually act on these um, alerts, on the errors, or even predictive measures. So it really moves you into the smart factory um, process. And all this is at the basically palm of a person's hand uh, in their self and their smartphone, uh, or even Bluetooth earphones uh, that might be even noise canceling. 
uh, alerting them so you're hands free and you know when there is an issue. Um, so it's really, really meant for um, uh, basically running the plant in an optimized way. And it's really like gives the, the operator superpowers almost. And then at the end, of course, uh, at the end of the day, you can do optimization of all this. You see, oh, uh, I had uh, X alarms from this one machine, a scale on line two in the factory X. Uh, why is this happening? And you can go back and you can do a continuous improvement um, on this topic as well. So you get transparency across the organization. You can see across plants performance. You can figure out very quickly where issues are or what some are doing that are leading practices. Um, so I know I've talked a lot about uh, in principle, but how about uh, I show you just a brief video that we made in preparation of this launch um, that gives you a bit of an idea of uh, what I'm talking about here. I'm going to give the, uh, the screen here to somebody else who will share with us this uh, cool video. Well, we'll try. Maybe working, maybe not. Tempting. With uh, Alplus Smart Production, we aim to develop a solution that identifies problems real time on the production floor and then provides a solution support system as they encounter the problem. Therefore, we introduce Crate On because the system has uh, huge advantages for us with this idea of a process monitoring and process flow digitalization. It's scalable, which is important to cover at the end stage our 180 sites, and it allows us to take the learnings from the different sites and with that continuously feed and improve the operating system and with that create more impact on the floor. Create Arm is a smart... Well, I don't think you need to see me here again. I'm already speaking. Coincidentally, even wearing the same clothes. Well, wow, how wonderful. So. Let me share my screen. So what did you see here? Um, and it obviously only gave you a small glimpse uh, of what I'm talking about. Uh, but uh, let me... Um, so um, what you saw here, the person speaking is the CEO of the customer where we implemented this. This is the uh, company is called Alpla. They're a market leader in the production of uh, plastic bottles, think Coca-Cola bottles, but also like many of the bottles that you see when you go into the grocery aisles, like soap dispensers, uh, dishwashing liquids, um, hand liquids and things like that. So these kinds of bottles, that's what they make. And that is what we have in production, uh, have this in production today. Um, so you saw that uh, we have this implemented and the customer is very happy. Uh, these are our Lighthouse customers. We greatly collaborate with them, uh, all three of us, with Yorms company as well. So what exactly have you seen there? Um, technically speaking, um, it is a SaaS application. Um, it is on a mobile device, on a tab, uh, also of course then centralizes um, on the web with a mobile interface. Um, today we're running this on, uh, in this case, in the, uh, completely in the Azure cloud. So Microsoft was one of our early um, deep collaborator in terms of enabling also very high standards of SLAs. Um, because as you can imagine, this is a seven by 24 production here in all these sites. Um, and when you not only have workflows of uh, operations in a system, but you also centralize the operations of the plant itself with the machine alarms and predictive analysis, um, this needs to be at a very high availability and uh, obviously very fast. So we've been working closely with Microsoft on this. Um, it connects directly to the MES system, in this case, the customer has, and the backend uh, ERP system, as well as the PLCs um, systems, um, so the, the machine layer systems uh, of the factory itself. And um, you can see uh, where it really shines in the sense, and what we've really focused on is to enable the worker and, uh, and you know, supervisor maintenance team and so on um, of a factory. So it's the workflow in there the user setup to be able to have different levels of users and visibility to be able to drop over activities and hand it off to somebody else virtually uh, that then of course goes back into the records of the operations manual and, uh, and operations log uh, for tracking. So this is what we really focused on in addition to the high availability. 
Um, what does it really uh, connect with? Um, I mentioned in this case uh, with our uh, pilot customer, first one, uh, it connects to the MES system, but it also could connect to a SCADA system or PLC directly. And so um, uh, because we have open standards and uh, a very open architecture, so depending on the environment of um, a customer, we will take a look of what their environment is and how it best connects. And then we basically interface into this, also look at the data uh, connectivity and, uh, and see um, where the master of the data for the company is, because obviously um, we're talking about ground field operations and it needs to fit into the existing infrastructure of a customer and everybody has a, a something a, a little bit different. So I know I uh, went totally now into technology speak. And Joram is already laughing here because we said it takes three corners here. Um, and I just basically explained the technology right uh, with a little bit of a video. Um, but Joram, I know uh, you're itching to also talk about the other yeah. two corners uh, because it's not all about just having software. No, it is not. So if you want to drive in true employee okay. engagement, there's actually a couple of key components that you need to take into consideration, something we've learned uh, from our customers. First of all, the process of this digital change and the new technology, it needs to be easy. It's quite obvious, but a great user experience, a great user interface is key there. The reason for that is if it becomes easy, then it can also become fast. And speed is essential. We humans, we don't like to wait anymore. We don't like to wait for a video to load. We don't like to wait for a, a PDF to download or whatever it is. We like our information now. We like it fast. And this applies to pretty much everything these days. Our attention spans are becoming shorter. Our patience is becoming thinner. There is a good thing because now with the web and these always online cloud-based solutions, we can offer the user that. And what we've seen is if you make a solution both easy to use and quick to deploy, that's when you also drive true engagement because then people can really start to love the product. They're feeling engaged with it. They're, they're loving the solution. So if you think about um, driving adoption, I would recommend always keep in mind the ease of use, the speed of use, and thinking about how people can learn to love your technology because without the involvement of the workers, it's often not going to happen. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that something I'd like to, to explain is that very often when companies are traditionally pushing change down from management down to the workers, it's often exactly that. It's being pushed down, top down. Now, what we often see in practice, and if you, the next slide will illustrate that, what we often see in practice is that this movement of pushing down some kind of change is often bypassed. In practice, uh, suppose you have this knowledge repository of how to guide and, and, and libraries that you have carefully crafted by engineers in the central management office. Often on the work floor, you still have people asking each other, say, um, Jerry, could you show me how to do that cleaning of the machine? You did it last week, right? Could, could you show me? Because I don't want to bother finding the information on SharePoint or whatever it is. So the solution is it needs to be there when they need it uh, at their fingertips. Now, the solution, of course, on the next slide is that you come with a holistic approach. And I just don't mean this in some kind of kumbaya setting or some guy, hey, let's just make the world a, a hippie flower power place. No, it's really driving engagement by involving the workers on the floor to contribute to this knowledge base and uh, listening to them, speaking their language, being present on their device when they need it. And that's kind of the point I want to make is true employee engagement hinges on participation. So to summarize that in the next slide, um, if you want to make people really engage with the digital change, uh, there's a couple of things uh, I would love to, for you to consider. First of all, people love to learn by watching another. The picture on the right is a perfect example. If you've given everybody the anybody the chance, they would prefer to just learn from an experienced coworker. Now, in reality, this isn't possible because that coworker is not always there. 
they're leaving the company. There's this famous uh, uh, brain drain and, and the and the big, um, uh, uh, what's it called? The Northern employees are leaving the company. There's a big movement there. So you want to digitize that process. And to do that, you have to make it fun, easy, and fast. Also, the video, you want to make it um, there. It give, gives people a video because that's really essential. Focus on authentic content. And you know, when a, this way, you can reduce the churn of employees uh, and give people better training. But I'm going to stop here to move on. No, totally. Um, I mean, I, I see the same thing, uh, especially uh, the home learn each other. I mean, what did this bring? Um, you know, it's cool to implement the smart factory technology, but in the end, I mean, nobody does it for the fun of it. Uh, it's all um, a, an interruption and distraction uh, to the current uh, flows that are going on in current operations. It's got to bring something. And so uh, what we saw is um, initially, yeah, how did the company do this? Uh, they started first uh, in a small pilot in one plant, uh, do the proof of concept. And that was um, yeah, when we first got involved about uh, three years ago um, and collaborated on that. Um, and, um, and then they realized, oh, this is really cool and actually brings something. And what does it bring? In this case, uh, in the customer's case that we have, uh, it brings really two critical areas um, that are tangible. One um, is uh, the the company does have, I mean, it's always challenging to, uh, especially in the manufacturing space, to uh, keep down, um, to keep the um, retention as high as possible. But if you do have turnover, then the question is, how do you ramp up people as they are, the operators as quickly as possible? And if you have some leading tool like this and you get them ramped up very quickly, that um, basically increases the quality significantly uh, and also brings your OEE up. And so uh, what we've seen, um, and obviously it's easy to say, but uh, just end of last year, meaning 2021 in November, um, we worked with uh, our, uh, um, our customer to bring up another plant uh, from scratch. They'd never seen this before. And uh, it actually was fantastic, not just fantastic from the adoption, um, but also fantastic from um, the immediate standardization and the the adoption of the technology and then uh, using the technology to standardize and to uh, to improve what the teams were doing. So within a three week time frame, from uh, first seeing this to then a week of transition um, and training and then implementation of full life system um, is uh, um, then immediately afterwards, there was a significant improvement on that. The second case on this one, uh, in this one customer use case, is uh, because um, we are taking in the information, the life information of the machine data and sensors, um, the company is actually able to um, have as little raw material, meaning plastic granulates as possible, while still staying within the range, the allowable range. Most companies, and for most products, there's always a range, uh, run at the midpoint. Um, and then you're on the safe side and then the, the machines and the whole operations goes out of bounds on the left or on the right. In this case, because of the close monitoring and the real-time changes and also the predictive na the nature of information the workers are getting, they're running the input of granulates, which is the main cost driver in this case, at the very low end of the range. And so um, this way, uh, obviously saving significant costs in raw material. So of course, this is different for every company, but in this case, it brought not only um, standardization of uh, processes uh, and onboarding, cut off a you know, significant reduction in onboarding of new employees time, but also uh, OEE in uh, cost reduction of raw materials. The last one, what we found is, uh, and it's intangible because we're still measuring, but it's a bit hard to measure, um, and uh, workers normally are pretty much the last ones to get leading edge tools uh, like uh, a cool smartphone that's fully enabled. And uh, it, um, it really does help as an employer of choice to be in leading edge factories versus some old um, something. Can it be measured just yet? Or uh, do, we have, do I have a hard tangible number on this yet? Uh, no, not yet. Um, our uh, development partner is working on it um, to check this and basically we're all measuring, but um, 
it clearly made an impact. It makes an impact in attracting new employees uh, for the customer. Um, and it's also making impact in terms of being really happy um, of having leading edge tools and working with cool technologies that we're all used to at home and in our private lives. And finally, you have this at the workplace. So to the I, point of making it fun and easy. I agree, Eva. And this is something we see also uh, in our experience. So a couple of the points that you mentioned really resonated with me. Uh, first of all, one was the reduction of uh, materials required for the production line. We've seen in some customers that having the instructions available helps them save wasted materials in terms of production batches that go wrong. That turns out to save them sometimes millions. Another interesting example I wanted to um, mention is the use of video. Because too often, if you don't use video, it's not quite clear exactly how you need to do something. In one particular uh, story that springs to mind, we had a metal factory. They produce galvanized steel. And they had uh, three production shifts and three teams on each of those shifts. Now, it turned out that the quality of the output of the material the core of the steel changed from team to team. And they couldn't quite figure out why that was until they used video instructions that were created by the people themselves. Because then it's no longer one person that creates the video and just says, this is how you now do things. No, they were able to source different ways of working from the teams. And they were able to see that, for instance, one person cleans the, the zinc bath the, like this, and the other person cleans it like that. And the exact nature of the movement was often overlooked, but it turns out to have a tangible, measurable effect on the quality of the steel. And that's exactly what we're doing in this case as well with our Quay Dome solution, because we took the leading practice of uh, what you just described. It's the exact same thing. So what we've done is in the plant, as um, of course the company had operating manuals, and it's a highly standardized operation, um, and they're slightly different across the uh, across the different plants as to produce different things. But uh, as uh, we looked at the manuals, um, this is great to have them, but uh, who has the time when you're in the middle of an operation to start reading manuals? It just doesn't work. So what we did is we had the workers uh, tape the videos of the real machines in that plant. Um, and so when you then go, it's like, oh, step next is uh, go over to this plant and do a change of plot. Um, and I, as a new worker, or maybe I have a question, it's like, how does this work? Click of a button, live, small video, short, not long, that is immediate and exactly that machine. Um, and that then gives you the 10 second, 15, 20 second overview of how the step works. That exactly then moves along and that is where the significant improvements come from. It also comes from the improvement from one shift change to another shift change, or then continuous improvement. Um, it's like, hey, we could do this different, or how does one plant do this versus another plant, and shouldn't we improve this? And it goes back into um, a process of then putting it into the company-wide operations manual uh, of what is the approved new standard uh, going forward. Absolutely, and as you have different plants uh, doing things in different ways in different regions, uh, you want to standardize that process. And um, uh, yeah, that really helps. But I'm going to yeah. let you continue. No, totally. I mean, so we were talking about uh, basically enabling small factories, uh, smart factories and industry 4.0. And uh, I, I know the audience, we all know this uh, kind of these five, six stages here of the um, going towards autonomous. And I just wanted to highlight of where we, with our solution together here, what we're really honing into. Um, and it starts really in this... Uh, um, stage three here, where you're starting to go and really doing something with the data that in, in real time, and not just historically reviewing and doing continuous improvement over time, um, which we've been at um, in industry for uh, 3.0, uh, but now 4.0 is you're moving into the third stage here where you have real time information and what are you doing with it. This is exactly where Quake OM starts um, actually then uh, making an impact. And now uh, you, you heard me say, oh, not only do we do the real time or taking the alarms from uh, machines in real time, but there's sensor data, uh, maybe images uh, that get uh, 
created in real time that affects then some uh, predictive calculations. So we're in stage four as well on this. Uh, so, so when you're as a manufacturer and stages or want to go to three and four and further, that is where the solution comes in to really make uh, basically superheroes out of your uh, manufacturing stuff, simply said. So uh, I know another topic here is uh, transparency across the, term, uh, the, the organization. I mean, we've talked about more or less at the plant level or maybe doing more or less the same thing at different plants but, uh, and optimizing across. But maybe, uh, Joram, give us a bit yeah. of your background and what you've seen of um, you know, what's the next level beyond that. Yeah, so obviously transparency data is a big part of that. Huh? And this is something where, of course, Create is traditionally uh, the master of data. And they, 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 uh, you can easily monitor and, and analyze that data on the fly, real time. Now, there's also an element of transparency to the human operator and, and how they work in this big organization. And one thing I like to say is, uh, ultimately, you want everybody to speak the same language, to, to talk about the same topics in the same way, and to, to have a framework where people can actually collaborate on that. So one way of putting that is you want a single source of truth. You want to know what it exactly is that you need to do, and don't, you don't want to rely on hearsay or on, on just asking a colleague. You want that digital single source of truth. Um, what's also clearly important in multinational organizations is that you want this information to be available in all of the company's language. And this may not be a big issue for the engineers because usually their English can be the lingua franca, but in the workers, with the workers on the work floor, there you see different languages being spoken throughout. And if you don't engage those workers and you don't by making the content available in their languages, you will run into problems. So part of that, as I mentioned in the story before, is, is just eliminating all the, of the differences between the ways of working and, and creating transparency on how people across different plans are working. So it might be that you, know, you have different ways of working in the beginning, but somehow you need to converge across shifts, across plans, across countries, because there is one way that is the best way. And you continuously improve and learn from these um, and the way you do that actually is one of the last bullet points there is the by establishing communities of practice. Now, what I mean with communities of practice is that you are actively asking your workers to contribute to the best ways of working. You're getting them together, whether it's in, in, in video calls like this or um, in other ways of working, just on a local level on the shop floor. You want people to work together on this continuous improvement. Um, so what you'll also do this way is avoid the risk of what we call shadow manuals. Now, what are shadow manuals? Those are um, a second source, a second source of truth that is not the official source of truth. That often exists. Sometimes it's paper-based. Sometimes it's somebody in a plant just sticking a post-it note on a machine. We've seen that happen as well. Sometimes the manual is a post-it note stuck on the machine. Now, where's your industry 4.0 when you have people doing that, right? So you want to avoid that parallel way of working. Um, and uh, an easy to use solution for digital manuals is their key. Now, uh, another important thing that I can't stress enough is speed is key. If your manuals are becoming outdated, if your instructions are becoming outdated, they will end up not being used. So you need a way to quickly update and in, in instructions as well, bearing in mind the stringent control processes that are there and the quality control that you need. But still, with those quality control systems in place, you still want to keep your manuals up to date. And then in the end, we come, kind of come full circle and come back to, to create um, and that we have the same approach to um, measuring stuff. We just measure the heck out of uh, everything that the human operator does with our instructions. And this helps um, uh, users of our joint solution to quickly identify what's being used, what needs updating, what's missing, where, where there are issues or what needs improvement and things like this. So those are a couple of um, things that I wanted to share with regards to transparency. 
Um, maybe Eva, you have your own take on this from a technological angle on, on transparency. Yep. Um, and I see some questions also coming in. So uh, yes, we'll, we'll get to those as well. Um, yeah, I see the same. Uh, and you mentioned um, you know, how to basically um, the control or update and be at the latest uh, and having a process of making sure that the procedures get uh, basically are at the latest and have the best practices. In addition to that, uh, because we, uh, we have really two, two big um, workflows in the system, is um, in our case, um, in addition to this, the pilot customer is also using this basically to do um, a deep analysis on continuous improvement of operations itself. So I think uh, because we connected uh, live alarms um, and also this predictive information of um, you know, select machines, they're doing a, um, you know, a root cause analysis after the fact and then improving on that. So I think um, right now in step one, in this one use case, they're doing it after the fact. Uh, we're also working on attaching and basically machine learning systems to move into the more predictive area of the, the next stage of the uh, smart factory side of things. So the question is, uh, how does one do this and how does one start this? This is actually a very good question. Uh, what we have, I urge you to take a look at this website down there because this is where we are together um, you know, that describes the solution a bit better. So what it is um, and how I would suggest uh, starting this is take a look at that. Um, most customers, what they see is, yeah, take, uh, depends what you have. If you have like a test line or in a, in a lab, uh, a, a pilot line of some sorts where you test some things out like leading edge uh, concepts before anything goes into production, um, I would urge you to uh, take and basically apply our solution and see whether it works um, for you. Um, and, uh, and then see uh, very quickly whether it uh, basically fits into the, um, into the stack that you have into the lay of lands. Um, depending where you are physically, uh, we actually team with system integrators uh, in the area of Industry 4.0 and uh, smart factory implementations uh, to help with that if you desire. Um, if you have the internal team, then we can work directly with you, both of us, um, just to clarify the, um, the manual solution of the embedded videos is actually a part of the create own solution. Um, you could, in theory, there's other, if you just you don't want the create own solution, but you just want, let's say, um, the, the videos and the manuals, especially if, let's say, uh, uh, in HR processes or in other processes beyond smart factories, then um, you know, URM would be the primary main contact. We're talking smart factories, then create home is what we're talking about. This is already embedded. You don't need to do anything for that. You just need to set it up then. Um, what we do is very simply said, uh, we do a, a, a small test with you in a non-production uh, environment first um, to make sure it fits in, to take a look of what uh, data you have, also what a connectivity should be technically, um, depending on also um, what you want to do with it. Uh, and how important the real-time aspect is. Um, if it's very important, then obviously the system where we're getting the data needs to update real-time as well, and not just uh, once every hour. Uh, that would defeat the purpose. So we're looking at uh, the data flows, uh, the timing of the data, and where we would dock in um, existing systems. Then you test it out, see whether you like it. And then if you have a uh, some kind of... Uh, I don't know, um, some, most customers have a, a test plant. They try things out or multiple for various technologies. I think that is where uh, you would want to test this on a line um, and see um, how, um, you know, what the core benefit or that it brings the core benefit to your uh, plant as well. So this is how you would start. What we're doing is uh, we have an early adopter prom, uh, program running right now. What does that mean? That means... Um, we launched a solution end of last year, 21. And um, right now our product team is going to be heavily involved to make, just make sure uh, that we have a deep uh, finger on the pulse of what you need. Uh, we have quite a roadmap. I saw I showed a, um, a little slide earlier. You'll get the slide deck um, of the roadmap items. And I just want to make sure that in the early adopter program, the needs of the first, uh, the next customers are very much net met. What am I talking about? Um, I mentioned uh, we're right now 100% on the Azure cloud. Um, 
it is very clear to us as we even implement with uh, our customer Alpla, we're going to have an edge solution as well. We do have the edge solution, but just not um, you know, at this customer just yet that's coming up. If you, uh, let's say, um, we're already working with some other customers that say, oh, we have a deployment in Asia, the internet in that country is very slow. We want the real-time aspect. This doesn't work for us because it's too slow and not stable enough. We want the edge implementation right away. Then we're going to do that. Um, some other customers might say, oh, we are on cloud something else. Um, and we really want to make sure this works on that. Um, then you're going to get the deepest attention from our product team uh, just to make sure that the next few customers have the direct impact um, and the deep connection. Um, so uh, in terms of roadmap um, and uh, if, you know, as we build more and, uh, and substantiate um, or you say, oh, we have MES system so-and-so, uh, can it connect? Um, most certainly yes, but uh, we're just going to make sure um, in the test that it really does. So I hope this makes sense. Cost-wise, what does this cost? Um, the solution is depends on the complexity of the plant and uh, the applications, the depth of the application. In general, you can think um, it starts at roughly uh, 10K per plant per year uh, as a SaaS offering um, and goes to between 10 and 100K per plant per year, roughly. Um, wide ranges depending on what you use it for and also how complex the processes are. Um, but basically what it is, is you take the application, um, you set up the flows, how you want them to have, um, and, uh, and then uh, um, you basically can do the live videos if you choose to, uh, or you can uh, also bring in the, um, the real-time data from the machinery and the alarms and the nodes um, to do this. So um, let's see, I hope this uh, answered the first question. Let me just go through a, a few other questions um, that I'm just reading here a bit. Can somebody post something else, please? I know there might be a few more questions out there and we still have three minutes. So I see a question of, uh, which system integrator might this be? Um, it depends where you are. Um, if you're in the DACH area, um, so Central Europe, then uh, our uh, we have several, but uh, the deepest system integrator we use is Zulke. Uh, you may know them. They specialize in the area of Industry 4.0 and uh, smart factories. Uh, we're also part of the Microsoft, uh, what they call Genesis program, or uh, manufacturing ecosystem program, and there is uh, um, three other system integrators, PwC, Accenture, and Robotron, um, also involved with that. So, uh, um, and uh, if you're in Asia, and then, uh, well, those are global companies anyway, but just let us know where you are, and uh, or whether you have a preferred one yourself, and uh, we can probably uh, figure it out. Uh, we do have ourselves uh, a small team of uh, subject matter experts that uh, can also train your internal teams um, or any of your basically house system integrator um, if desired. Let's see, I'm just looking up equipment integration, which assets can be connected? Um, yep. Um, and uh, what type of data can there is expected for them to transmit? Actually, I have a product manager, Philip. Uh, Philip, can you please start answering the, the data and the transition part? Um, and then equipment integration today, what we have um, actually is, uh, in this case, it's a plastic manufacturer. So all their machines actually are uh, integrated, including their QA machines, not just the live, uh, um, the live uh, production machines, but uh, all the scales are uh, integrated and we're working. The next thing is going to be the integration of the maintenance department. But basically every single machine that is in the plant is in there. Um, how long does it take to do a test? And then Philip uh, Petkov, please uh, answer the data component. Security, data, privacy question. Um, that depends how we deploy it. Um, so if it's on the edge, then the security, obviously the application sits in your firewall uh, and is part of your IT stack. Um, and uh, then actually uh, it depends what the level of cloud connectivity is, which cloud providers you have. But we would definitely look at uh, uh, 
um, yeah, it's obviously highly secure and um, it would be connected to your stack um, if you want to manage it. Uh, if otherwise it's uh, in a highly secure stack on ours, it's also user customer centric. So um, while the hosting is of course um, global or by region, depending what country you choose to do, um, the, the data is always yours and the data privacy is always your data. It's none of our data, it's all your data. It also stays with you. We do not have access to your data. There is no selling of data, sharing of data or any of that. Uh, it is by customer and only yours. Uh, we are a tool, we're an application that you choose to use like any other SaaS uh, company um, or edge and cloud uh, connected uh, application. I see another last question here. I know we're over by how long will it do to do a test or POC? Um, depending of uh, assuming that you have uh, the infrastructure ready, meaning actually there is data coming from your send from your machines, or there is a connectivity going, um, the setup actually takes just uh, you know, a very short time. Depends how many use cases you want to implement and basically set up in terms of notifications or how many types of users want to set up. But uh, I think uh, it can be definitely done. Um, in uh, you know, a short time period, meaning um, a few weeks. But it depends really on, uh, are you ready as a company? Where will we um, basically you know, talk on? Um, and how deep of a POC or a pilot do you want to do a test? Um, how many use cases you want to try? What kind of use cases? So the easiest way to do this is to just have a talk with us, uh, ping us. You can also just uh, directly contact uh, me, uh, but on the slide, as you I think it's hopefully still showing, um, the, the fastest way to get our sales and product team is this alias at the bottom right, or me, but them is better, um, because then it goes straight to the right team that is immediately going to contact you then. So you will get the slides afterwards, and uh, I am very much looking forward uh, to hearing from you, and so is Joram, and Joram, I... Uh, Really appreciate you joining us here today. Uh, for Thank more you. questions, feel free to ping us directly. Also me on LinkedIn, if you want, or Yoram on LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, and otherwise this alias down there on the right is actually directly um, our lead team on uh, for the Creatium solution. Indeed. So thank you, Yoram, and thank you. Uh, thank you. Audience. I appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody.